Hi everyone, John Pokertrip Friedberg here with another episode of Stacking Chips, your strategy source for the 2007 World Series of Poker, the Bellagio Cup, and the dozens of other events going on right here in lovely Las Vegas. Today is Tuesday, and yesterday was the $2,500 shorthanded No Limit Hold'em event. I'm happy to, to have made it onto day two. We started with about 800 players yesterday, and we're down to, I think, 42 players now. The top 78 were paid, so we're, we're in the money. Not too deep in the money, but I think the lowest I'm guaranteed right now is about 6400 which is uh, not too bad for a 2500 buy-in, but obviously I'm going for the uh, first place prize, which is about $515,000. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm probably the shortest in chips right now. I have about, <laughs> I'm about 24000 in chips going into day two. The blinds are going to be 1500 and 3000 and unluckily for me, I'm in the big blind to start the uh, tournament today. So I'm not too happy about that, but I do claim myself to be the short stack ninja, so uh, I'm not as uncomfortable as many would be in this spot. But uh, before we have a guest on today, I want to talk a little bit about my, my tournament yesterday. Overall, I would say I played best poker I've ever played in my life today, or sorry, yesterday. I, um, I just absolutely had my A game on. I, I, you know, I really didn't have the highest of expectations going into this tournament. I would say I tend to be a stronger full ring player, you know, ten, nine or ten handed player as opposed to a six handed player, but uh, I sort of proved myself wrong yesterday. I, I played great, I had control of every table I was at, and um, actually had a lot of chips until about the last 45 minutes of the day when uh, I lost a monster pot, which I will also talk about. But uh, for the most part, I just, I really took control of all the tables. I gambled a lot yesterday, which was was actually a good thing because it's always nice when you have chips to gamble with because uh, of course that's what it takes to win tournaments in my opinion and um, I'm more than willing to do that when necessary. So I want to talk about a few hands that I played yesterday. Um, I cracked aces two times yesterday and um, I would say both times I, I didn't necessarily get lucky per se given the situations but um, certainly the way the hands played out, my opponents probably could have won the hands had they played them a little differently. First, first time I had um, King Jack offsuit, and again, in, in a shorthanded tournament, your range of hands to open with and raise and and whatnot is much wider than it would be at a full-handed table, because even in second position, you're really like the cutoff plus one. You're you know you're you're really only two in front of the button or so. So you really have to take that into consideration. So your raising hands are going to be much wider here, which also allows you to get sort of underneath your opponent's skin. When they see you making a lot of raises, you know, they, they start to get a little upset with that, and they start to take things personal, and eventually they're just going to, you know, fire all in on you without a hand thinking that you have nothing. So you can really take that, use that to your advantage. So anyway, the first hand that I beat aces, I had king-jack offsuit. I was on the cutoff, which is one in front of the button, and the blinds were, what were the blinds? The blinds were uh, three and six hundred. So I make a standard raise. It's folded to me on the cutoff. I make a standard raise to, what did I say the blinds were? <laughs> three and six hundred, right. I make a standard raise to eighteen hundred. And the button, who had been making, he'd been coming over the top of me a lot, he made a raise to four thousand. Now that's only like a little more than twice what I bet. So. I already have 18 and it cost me 2200 to call. He had been re-raising me a lot yesterday, but he was typically making bigger raises against me. So I knew right away when he when he made a small raise there, I knew right away he had a premium hand, probably aces, kings, queens. I knew he had a monster there. But I also had like um I think I had probably 25,000 or 30,000 in chips with 18 in the pot. Of course I'm going to call another 22 just to take a flop. I know exactly what he has. And I know that if I hit a hand, that I can bust him. He had almost as many chips as I did. Actually, he had more chips than I did. He had me covered. So I call. Sure enough, the flop comes. King, Jack, three, rainbow. And I check to him. He, right away, he just declares all in. So I take off my headphones. I said, what did he say? Dealer said, all in. Sure enough, I insta-call with top two. And um, my two pair ends up um, holding to beat his aces. And I made quite a bit. I doubled up that hand up to like probably fifty thousand, and we're you know we're pretty early in the tournament. 
The next hand, um, I was in the small blind with the 10 jack of spades, and it was folded around to the button who had been making a lot of raises. And um, so, you know, w when people raise every time it's folded to them on the button, you just can't give them credit for, for a good hands. So again, I had a lot of chips at this, at this point, so um, it's folded around. He raised on the button, I look down, I have the king jack of spades, sorry, the 10 jack of spades, and um, I think the blinds at this point were four and eight. And I think he had raised it to 2200. And um, so I called 2200 from the small blind, big blind fold, so I'm heads up with the button. And the flop comes seven, eight, blank, like seven, eight, three or something. I think there's one spade on the board. I check. The button makes a standard continuation bet of, you know, maybe half the pot or something. So, or maybe three quarters of the pot. I went ahead and called this. Now, in a lot of spots, I'm going to fold this hand, but here's, here's what I was thinking. I have the flop is seven, eight, three, or, or whatever the low card was, I forget. With a spade, I have backdoor spade draw. If a nine comes, I have the nuts. If a 10 or a jack comes, I think my hand might be good. And furthermore, I've been playing with this guy all day long, and he had a, a very recurring pattern where he would make a lot of raises pre-flop, but if he missed the flop, he would still continuation bet. But then if he missed, if he still didn't have a hand on the turn, he would just check. So I figured I'm going to see a turn card here. I'm either going to hit a hand, or I'm going to find out if my opponent misses a hand, in which case I'm going to bluff on the river, and possibly even on the turn, depending on the card. Turn card comes a jack. And so now I have top pair. I have a gut shot straight draw. And um, my opponent has about 15,000 left or so, 15 to 17,000. Actually, I thought he had more like 12 or 13,000. So I go ahead and bet out 6,000, which is a, a pretty decent sized bet, considering the pot had probably about 8,000 in it or something, maybe eight or 9,000. I bet out 6,000, which is a pretty, pretty good sized bet. I'm doing it to knowing that even if he pushes here, I'm committed, thinking that he only has another six or seven thousand if he if he wants to come over the top. Anyway, he ends up going all in, and um, I think uh, he went all in for about he had more than I thought he had like eleven thousand more, but I still felt that I was priced and I still had a lot of chips to gamble with here, and you know I knew that any ten was good, any jack was good, and of course any nine was good. So I felt that I had a fair amount of hands. I felt that I was very close to being priced into calling here. And um, again, I did have a lot of chips to gamble with, and I do think it's important to gamble in the right spots if, if you don't cripple yourself by doing so. So sure enough, I call. He turns over two aces, and I tell him, I said, you're, you're ahead right now. I turn over my 10 jack, nine on the river to give me the straight. So that hand worked out very well for me. That put me up, you know, I forget the chip counts. There were so many hands, and I was up and down so many times yesterday, but that, that again, gave me uh, a lot of chips. Um, there was one hand. Actually, I, I had chipped up to about 95,000 yesterday when the blinds were um, the blinds were 1 in 2,000, actually. I had about 95,000. I was in good shape. Average was probably about 80,000, give or take. And um, it was folded around to me in the small blind, I had queen nine of hearts. Now, a lot of times I'm going to raise in this position, but there was a new player that had just come to the table. I didn't know I didn't know much about what he was, how he was playing, so I figured, you know what, I'm just going to see a flop here and see how things go. So I just call with the queen nine of hearts. It's folded around to me. I call with the queen nine of hearts. Big blind checks his option, and the flop comes nine eight five, and, and there were no hearts. There were actually two spades and a club. Nine eight five. I um, I went ahead and bet out here. I bet about four thousand. Again, thinking there's there's a possible straight draw, there's a flush draw. My hand is not that strong. I don't have any backdoor hearts, so I'm just going to make a big bet here and try to get my opponent to fold right away because I don't want him drawing at me. I don't want to slow play this. I don't have much of a hand, but I do have top pair with a decent kicker, heads up in the blind. So that's typically that's going to be a good hand. So I bet out four thousand. There's you know. We have our 4,000 in plus the antis, so there's like 5,500 in the pot. I bet 4,000. He raises another 9,000, leaving himself about 30 behind. So he raises 9,000. Again, he was new to the table. I did hear him talk, and I knew he was European. 
And, um, you know, I do judge players based on where they're from. A lot of European players play very fast when their head's up in the blinds like that, especially in the late stages of tournaments. So he made a raise to 13,000 total, or 13,500 or something, but he did it in a very sloppy way. He didn't stack the chips out. He just sort of put them in and pushed them forward. And it felt to me that he just put me on a bluff because I did make a big bet there, and a lot of times when a player makes a, a decent-sized bet there, it looks like he is bluffing when, they, when, they, when the blinds are heads up. So he makes, a, uh, he makes a raise where he just sort of looks like he just took a handful of $1,000 chips and put them out in the pot. And um, after they counted out and everything and, and figured out that he had 13 in, he still had 30 behind, I thought that I could get him off the hand. And I honestly thought that I had the best hand at the time. I thought that he either put me on a bluff or he had some kind of straight draw or possibly even a flush draw or maybe even a weak nine. He could have made that bet with a pair of eights. I mean, there's, there's a lot of a very wide range of hands that he could have done that with. And again, I felt that I had the best hand. I had a lot more chips than he did. So I just pushed all in. And he thought about it forever, which um, didn't make sense to me when he ended up eventually calling and turning over 8-9. He, he flopped the top two pair. So I was drawing very thin. And um, I did not improve that hand. That put me down to about 20,000 in chips, playing 1-2 blinds with like 30 to 45 minutes left in the day. So that was unfortunate, but uh, I think I stole the blinds, you know, once or twice after that. I got up to about 24,000, which is where end of the day. We're starting today at uh, 2 o'clock. And again, I have 24,000 chips. The blinds are going to be 1,500 and 3,000. 42 of us left. I'm in the big blind. First place is 515,000. I'll need some luck early, but I'm very comfortable with the short stack, and hopefully things will go my way. So enough ranting about yesterday's event. I'm looking forward to day two today, but let's get to our guest now. He is a World Poker Tour winner. He won uh, the Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure event at Atlantis in the Bahamas in January. It was his first major live tournament. He had mo he's mostly a cash game player. He's a, uh, a PhD student, and or he's studying right now to get his PhD in mathematics. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Dow. Ryan, thanks for coming on the show, man. Glad to have you here. Good to be here. So um, I met you in January mm -hmm. when you and I played. We both went deep in the uh, Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure, the World Poker Tour event. We both final tabled it, um, but you ended up winning it for about one and a half million dollars, which is about one point four million more than what I got. But um, yeah, how do you feel? Like, what what was that like? Um, it was pretty crazy because uh, before that I was mainly an online cash game player, and uh, I didn't really play many tournaments at all. So I just decided on a whim to go play it. And, uh, you know, cash game players, we can't really have big scores besides, you know, how much you can win in a day. And, you know, coming up with a big score like that is, is really, really shocking. So what was it like then? Had you played many tournaments before this event? Not really. I, uh, I was pretty much one of the worst poker uh, tournament players online because I would just, like, I would get so frustrated if I didn't double up in the first hour. I would just give up for the first, like, six months of tournaments I played. And then uh, I had a TLB race, and uh, I sort of concentrated on tournaments during that month in, I think, last August, and I, I started to get better at them. And, uh, I mean, that's when I basically started playing more tournaments in probably, like, two a week, but not really that many. So when, when you're a cash game player, an online cash game player, which goes very fast-paced, I imagine you multi-table, mm -hmm. what, what exactly, what types of things do you need to transition about your game to go into a live event? Well, it was really easy to transition into the first few levels of the tournament because, you know, you're deep stacked and you have a lot more experience playing deep stack poker than everybody else you're playing against. So the first two or three levels are, are really easy for cash game players. But then after that, you really have to just, you know, transition into figuring out what hands you can play in certain stages and how you have to, you know, switch gears. Um, pretty much just, you know, learn how to play short stack. And uh, not too many cash game players know how to do that that well. So I'm, I'm a firm believer that that being a, a good tournament player is more about understanding how to play your opponents in a tournament, right? Using the clock to your advantage, knowing that the levels are going to be increasing, using the chip stacks to your advantage, yours relative to theirs. You don't necessarily have those aspects in a cash game. So did you find it, diff I mean, did things just go your way or did you find that you were able to use some of those factors to your advantage when playing against your opponents? I think I kind of just got lucky and stumbled onto it. Like, a lot of people, I feel like they pick up poker um, in a lucky way. Like, 
something they try just happens to work. And I think that's basically what just happened with me. Like, I just kind of stumbled onto the correct way to do things. I didn't really know at the time, um, you know, how to adjust to certain things and how to adjust to different stack sizes in a tournament. But uh, I guess it just kind of worked itself out. And going into the final table, the, the final six, if I remember right, Isaac Haxton had possibly the biggest chip lead in WPT history going into the final table. I don't know that. I'm just guessing. You must have had He had like 12 million, and second place had like three or four million. Or yeah, something. there were three of us with two and a half, and he had about nine and a half. So okay. he had almost a four to one chip lead on us. So how did that go? Like, how, how, did, how did you win? <laughs> and well, not him. Well, we still had a, a lot of play left, actually, because uh, for the TV table, they bumped the, the blinds down at first. So the blinds were 15 and 30K, and uh, I had about 2.3 million. So I still had about 80 big blinds. So it was still kind of playing like a six handed catch game. So I just kind of played straightforward for a little while, you know, standard aggro uh, and solid. And uh, I mean, I picked up a few big hands that allowed me to double up. And when I got to heads up, I, I had 5 million. He had about 13 million. So I was still within striking distance. So tell us, um, tell us a little bit about your background. I understand your your PhD in math. I uh, I was originally uh, last year. I was in a grad uh, school program for uh, a math PhD at Penn State. It was my first year, and it was a five year program. And uh, I wasn't really uh, sure if that was what I wanted to do after I uh, graduated undergrad. But I decided to go through with it, and uh, I was doing well at poker last year, but not well enough that I could just drop everything for poker. So I decided to go, and then you know when I won uh, the tournament, I just decided that I should take some time off, and I'm taking a break from all the the PhD stuff right now. And do you plan on finishing your degree? I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's going to be a long time if I do decide to, because I only did one semester really. So I'd have to you know first do my uh, two years to get my master's, and then uh, you know the three extra years for the PhD. So it would be a lot of work ahead of me. So. Well, this might be a very silly question, considering you 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 are sort of a mathematics. Well, on you know, on the track to become a math PhD, do you consider yourself a math player? I mean, are you very analytical and always calculating the odds and probabilities of your hands, or do you more go with your gut on certain situations? Um, yeah, I'm definitely a math mathematical player. Um, I think everybody you know understand everybody who's a good player understands you know all the, the basic math, but um, I think about it on a, a little bit of a deeper level, like. Uh, Whenever I'm faced with a decision, I don't really go with my gut. Like, I think he has this here. I, I basically I put my own opponent on a range of hands, and I figure out my equity against that range, and, you know, figure out my odds, and work out if it's profitable to call and stuff like that. So um, I, I try to not go with my gut uh, as much as uh, with math. Uh, have you read many poker books in the past? I did when I was first starting out, and, you know, they, they helped me to figure out, you know, optimal ways to play low limits and stuff, but uh, I really haven't picked up too much from poker books besides maybe, you know, learning some things from Harrington. Okay. Yeah, Harrington books are great. Mm -hmm. I personally enjoyed those. The problem is everyone now is is playing like the Harrington books. You know, every anytime there's four or five limpers in a pot, someone squeezes, like Harrington mm -hmm. says. Anytime someone gets down to, you know, ten big blinds, which is usually about an M of three or four or whatever, mm -hmm. they're just pushing all in and uh, it's it's getting a little easier to play against people. In fact one of my one of my favorite moves right now is being the third or fourth. Like, I'll look down at kings or queens or aces, and there'll be two, three limpers in front of me. I'll just limp with those hands, knowing that more than half the time, somebody, you know, after me is just going to make some squeeze play, and then I'm going to win a big pot. So mm -hmm. it doesn't always work out that well, but there's so many people have read these Harrington books that they're all playing like that now. So I really think that there is an edge for people to sort of move beyond that and um, play against that theory. So anyway, we're, it's the World Series right now. How's that going for you so far? Um, the World Series hasn't gone too well so far, actually. Um, I final tabled Mandalay Bay right before the World Series started, and uh, I got ninth, which, which was like the worst thing ever because the, the payout structure was so steep that I didn't really get that much. Um, and then, you know, I've played probably about 10 World Series events. I've only cashed in one. So uh, I've, I've just been basically getting into some bad situations and, you know, not winning enough flips. But um, I got I got really lucky because uh, I'm I'm backing a few players and uh, one of them actually just won a bracelet so uh, oh, yeah. that basically saved my series. Yeah. Well, congrats on that. Yeah, thank you. So you mentioned that that cash game players are are you know typically good at deep stack poker. Mm -hmm. These World Series events are everything but deep stack poker. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that's to your disadvantage? I mean, do you feel that that's 
that's causing that's that's one of the reasons that your results haven't been that great so far this year. No, I uh, it would have been six months ago when I won the PCA, but uh, I, I've figured out how to play short stacked uh, as since then, and um, I mean I, I feel very comfortable both short stacked and deep stacked in these fields. I just think uh, I just haven't gotten lucky at the right times. So, I mean, once I start winning, from, winning some flips and winning some you know ace king versus ace queens, I'll I'll get deeper. So you plan on playing many more events this year? Yeah, I think uh, I'm going to play the PLO 1500 rebuy tomorrow, and then after that, um, the 5K 6 max event, and then I don't know what else there is, maybe the 2500 mix game. And you going to play the horse, the 50K horse? <laughs> no, I'm not going to be playing the 50K horse. I'll probably play the 2500 horse, but um, yeah, the 50K horse is just, you know, it's so much variance and such a big buy, and it's not really worth it. I agree completely. It's just not a very plus EV tournament, in yeah. my opinion. <laughs> I mean, I, I not for me. I can't speak for you. I'm pretty good at all the games, but uh, I just I don't think I have enough of an edge to make it worth uh, risking fifty thousand dollars. Right. Awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ryan Doubt. Ryan, thanks again for coming on the show. It's great, great to, to have you here. Well, that's it for today's episode of Stacking Chips. Make sure to tune in tomorrow and every day throughout the World Series for more strategy talk, discussion, interviews, and more right here on Card Player TV. And keep those emails coming in to stackingchips at cardplayer.com. From John Poker Trip Friedberg and Ryan Dow44 Dow. We're out of here. Good luck and I'll see you guys tomorrow. <laughs>